So last week's talk on the on invocation. I think the main theme in the invocation is that it's a recognition that we cannot use our familiar uh, thinking cognitive mode to develop jhana. We can't think ourselves into jhana. And so this week I'm talking about how to develop jhana in a bit more detail. In particular, the first two rupa jhanas. Now, some of you, you will have heard quite a lot of this before, um, but that's okay. My experience is that when I hear things, I pick up different things along the line. Um, so the rupa jhanas are referred to as the fine material realm, as distinct from the sensory realm. And I remember when I first came across that term um, over 50 years ago now, it was one of those uh, things, a bit like the Yoga Vacharas manual, that were evocative. There's something about the phrase, fine material realm, what's it mean? And it was evocative, but not really understanding why. And it took many more years before I began to properly understand what it means. The fine material realm, it's different to everyday sensory consciousness. And talking about the first Rupa Jhana means we have to understand the process of disengaging from our default habitual sensory consciousness, which if you remember, uh, certainly in the Bhojangas, I may not have mentioned it in this series of talks yet, but the phrase for developing the first Rupa Jhana starts with Vivicheva Garmehi. Vivicheva Garmehi, separated from sense desire, or apart from sense desire, probably better. So, in the background to everything I'm saying is this separation or disengagement. And in our tradition, in Anapanasati, we begin by establishing mindfulness on the breath, by counting. And this is an exercise in attention. And it's a very simple mental act of simply placing attention on each number as we breathe in and out. This is Vitaka, the first jhana factor, placing attention. It restricts the habits of sensory consciousness to a simple focus on the breath and the number, but it's still actually well within our default sensory consciousness. Still quite a way away from jhana, it's a starting point. Then we move to following the breath, um, which involves noticing the sensations in the body as the breath moves in and out. And the associated feelings, there's always a feeling component. The sensations are one thing in the body, but there's a feeling um, component to them, which is, unless someone is actually actively ill, is at least neutral. And in meditation is usually pleasant. Maybe not spectacularly so, but not bad. So just turning the attention to the breath and following it is the second stage beyond sati, which develops vichara, the second jhana factor, sustained attention. And to develop vichara, there has to be more than simply placing attention. To maintain it as the breath flows in and out without numbers, it means there has to be a kind of curiosity, an impulse towards understanding, towards meaning. And if you remember in the Bhujanga talks, this is where the second Bhujanga, the following sati, develops, that is, Dhamma Vichaya, investigation. And in the background to this, invocation that we talked about last week facilitates the whole process by recollecting a lineage. So it helps to already have a kind of direction, even though we don't know yet exactly what that leads to. We don't, we can't imagine yet what the experience of jhana will be, let alone the path. But it sets in motion a direction 
And gradually the other factors, virya, vigor, PT, energization, and finally, um, ekagata shitta or samadhi develops, samadhi of jhana. However, the, the two factors, vitaka and vichara, are absolutely central to the development of the first root vichana. I'm just going to share my screen. So, Vitaka and Vichara, the first Rupa Jhana has an associated simile. The simile is the simile of the bell. And it's a very useful simile, actually. The strike of the bell is Vitaka. And the reverberation, which gradually fades away, is Vichara. And if you practice this, it's a direct way of learning something about Vitaka and Vichara, and the routing to the first Rupachana. In many ways, far more effective than words. The reverberation requires that the listening to it, you have to maintain attention without wavering. To follow the reverberation means savoring the feeling and understanding that develops about reverberation. You know, imagine that you never heard um, a beautiful bell and beautiful reverberation before. There would automatically be interest and a foc focusing of attention and even reverence because the, the reverberation, if it's a nice bell, are quite beautiful. And then if that is applied to the breath in meditation, to the following in meditation, you have an idea of how vichara develops. So for some reason, when, when you sound a bell live on Zoom or any other platform like this, it's not terribly effective. Um, you probably notice when I, when I sound the bell for meditation, it's, it's pretty feeble. And so I, I'm going to try an experiment. I recorded a bell and I'm just hoping it will work better than a live bell. So here it goes. The the first strike is is a moment. Um, the bell, you strike the bell. It's exactly like the moment of ad 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 adverting to a number, one, two, whatever. That's the moment of sati that establishes a starting point. Actually a starting point in time and in space. The reverberation vichara is the continuous feel of listening to the, the, the sound of the bell gradually fade. And the parallel is to Vichara in meditation. Now, when you come to the end of that reverberation, if this was a better recording, but you may still be able to get some idea. If you can come to the end of the reverberation and it fades into silence and stay there without mentally moving in the stillness, in the silence, then that gives you an idea of exactly what develops in Anapanasati. Vitaka, Vichara, increasing stillness as you move to the touching and then the settling and to establish the nimitta. I'll sound it again. Um, if it's not terribly clear, you can try it yourself with a, with a bell, but certainly at Green Street. Some people mentioned last week in the discussion 
that in their normal meditation, they come to a point exactly around the stages we're talking about now, where there are moments of peace and happiness develop, but there's often a pull quite quickly back into thinking about it or mentally commentating on it. And this is the, this is the kind of um, interface between the beginnings of what leads to jhana consciousness and the pull back into the habit of sensory consciousness, of thinking, comparing, labeling, liking or not liking. But this is a really important point and absolutely no need to be discouraged because in, in many ways, unless we notice this, then the progress is quite difficult. The habit of thinking and labeling of comparison is so embedded, you know, if you think that we've lived within this since birth, actually earlier, you know, we're aware of the mother in the womb uh, for at least the second and third trimesters. And so we lived in this continuously, so it's no, it's no mean challenge to disengage from it. We have to get familiar with this interface. And when we feel that pull back, and then we come back to meditation, to do so with um, no discouragement, dispassionately. And gradually you get familiar with what, what is happening. Uh, confidence grows and the stillness deepens. We're able to stay with the stillness longer and able to gradually accept that it's okay to feel content in the body. Content in the body and beginnings of happiness in the mind means that we notice that it's quite freeing, actually, to just stay exactly where we are. Very simple, no need to go back to the complications of thinking and comparison. Once you get that sense, then you're well on the way. I should say something now at this stage about PT and the Nimitta. In the Yogavachara, PT is very important, um, which is again very interesting because in the reforms of the 1950s when Vipassana was heavily promoted, um, PT was not really valued in the same way. And this is probably because some of the manifestations of PT can be quite startling. And it may be that it got associated with uh, magical practices, even possession for some people. So PT was, was disregarded in many ways for many, many years. But in the, in the Yoga Vachara, it's central. So in the touching and settling stages, the sense of the mind and the qualities of the mind and consciousness become clearer simply because it's more still and less distraction. And the meditator leaves space to notice this. It's a kind of looking. You may have been told by your teacher at the beginning to kind of be open to seeing an imita or letting an imita arise but without knowing really exactly what is an imita. It's a kind of looking a bit like peripheral vision, not focusing in that sense of trying to see something, but leaving a kind of space for something that might become clearer. And often a sense of brightness develops. Not always, but often. Sometimes it may be diffuse, for some people very clear. It may have a colour, it may not. It may be diffuse and unlimited, or it may be quite focused, a bit like a um, full moon, or a sun, a sunrise, or a sunset. Sometimes meditators report they, they don't have an emitter, but that's very deceptive, because if you think about those moments of stillness that you're gradually getting familiar with and able to stay with longer, there has to be some quality of consciousness which holds it together. 
it's a little bit like becoming aware of the, the, the mind itself. So that holding something together, it's, some people experience it a little bit like touching something with the mind, but it may not be visual. Or some people may experience it as listening openly to silence. But the, there's something for sure that holds that stillness together. If you were um, thinking of it in terms of um, the philosophy of consciousness, what we're talking about is starting to recognize the qualia, the quality or the qualia um, of our own consciousness. And in breathing meditation, Anapanasati, it is quite subtle. This is why some people um, don't immediately recognize exactly what it is that they're explaining, that, we're, that they're experiencing. The first beginning of the, of the Nimitta is called the, um, the preparatory work, Harikana Nimitta. And it's said in the Yoga Vichara that we apprehend this Nimitta by the door of the eye. And what does that mean? In terms of the, what I just said earlier, leaving a space almost like peripheral vision is one way of looking at it. But in other forms of meditation, like a casino practice, you actually do use the eye. You may set up a, an earth casino, a disc of earth, or a colour casino, a disc of colour. Gaze at it, then close the eyes and take that in. So in those casino practices, you literally do work with the eye, the door of the eye. And it's much easier to recognise the quality of the limiter. So if it was the earth casino, for example, the feeling associated with it, the qualia of consciousness is very solid, very ground. So you might give this to a person who is a little bit not grounded. Color casino, if you've got the right color, a color you really, really like, then the nimiter of that is, is a qualia of beauty. Maybe also with the same color. <clears throat> and to begin with, the experience is changeable. It's not steady. But then as the, you get used to it, as the breath becomes finer, more subtle, it has to become finer and more subtle to stay with the stillness. Everything begins to gradually settle towards a more unified state. And at those, that point, you can recognize in your practice, you may be doing the, the touching and settling, that you're much more in an inner space of the mind. You're now more uh, disengaged from thinking, sensory consciousness. And the nimitta tends to settle down and become a little bit more simple and part of the stillness. And this is the second stage of development, the acquired sign, which is the door of the mind. If you then continue, finally, the nimitta, the breath, the in and out breath all start to merge together into samadhi, into the stillness. The nimitta becomes still as part of that, just one experience which is the threshold of samadhi and jhana and the nimitta at that point is called the counterpart sound sign that it's fully developed and it's apprehended by the door of touch which is a very interesting description of what you experience subjectively at this point in your meditation it feels as though uh, there's no separation between you the nimitta there's no split between subject and object. It's as, it's as though you literally are touching the experience. Now at the same time, as you get into this inner experience, the various manifestations of pity tend to develop. For some people more quickly than others. And in the um, Bath of Lanka, 
There are five levels of pity described. The first is Kodika pity, cool shivers covering the body. This point is the beginning of the body waking up and it happens mostly over the surface of the body. So what we tend to experience is prickling of the hairs on the head or the hairs on the body. Um, and as that develops and starts to permeate the body, spread into the whole body, is the second stage of Piti Kani uh, In the, in the um, Path of Lanka, it's described as cool envelops the body. In subjective experience, it's a sense that the body is becoming more and more part of the stillness, becoming suffused into the stillness. The next stage of development is that the pity so complete in the body that it doesn't just envelop the body, there's nothing, up, nothing left out. Or Kantika Piti. And beyond that, the Peka Piti is the kind of sense that the meditator has. Upeka Piti, the energy in the body, the waking up of the body becomes much freer. Um, freer and workable. In the Path of Lanka, it's described as the meditator feels that. He can re become raised or glides. And finally, in Paranapiti, this sort of completion of the body becoming part of the stillness. The emptying and inflation uh, is probably the sense you have when everything comes together and the piti becomes part of the nimitta, part of the in and out breath, as it just gently moves between in breath and out breath towards absorption. This is a comment from the Path of Lanka that is sometimes linked to the jhana factors, Vitaka Vichara, Piti Sukha and Agakata. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated than that, I believe, that the final stage of Piti only corresponds to the kind of completion stage of um, all the factors coming together. And in fact, it's quite difficult to, for a meditator to experience the, um, the third, fourth, and fifth levels of PT in the first Rupa Jhana. It's really developing the second Rupa Jhana that it becomes a very important part of discriminating what's happening in the body. When they are fully developed in the Patibhaga Nimitta, it's said that, in, again, in the Path of Lanka, that they're often experienced as light. And these are the descriptions from the Path of Lanka. Blue light of the head, gold light of the throat, white light of the heart, navel and head. Actually, listening to meditators describe their own experiences, I think there's a wide range of experience, actually. And so this is one of the examples in looking at fragments of the Yogavachara texts where it has to it ultimately go back to your own experience in meditation, not to rigidly take things at face value. Develops towards absorption in the way that um, I described. And if you stay with that at the end of the practice, stay with the stillness before you open your eyes, recollection, without thinking about the experience, just recollecting, recollecting the experience, then the main quality you would recognize is stability and steadiness with some degree of peace and happiness. But the key factors, the stability and steadiness, those are the qualities developed by Vitaka and Vichara having become stable. So the, the experience of PT, peace and happiness are not yet very strong in the first Rupachala. And if you stay with the stillness, that steadiness and firmness will remain for a while and gradually fade as you get drawn back into thinking and ordinary consciousness. So you know from that recollection at the end of practice 
immediately you know that you're still very near sensory consciousness. But you also know from that recollection that it's possible to develop a kind of quality of Vitaka and Vichara where you don't have to worry about it. It's become automatic. So if you go back into meditation with the intention that you can trust that it's automatic, and see the Vitaka and Vichara that you developed as part of the foundation, and you go back in, it'll become much clearer what else is going on in the mind, the other jhana factors, and you can develop the second group of jhana. At this stage, it's very helpful, in my opinion, for a meditator to practice the various lengths of breath. You may find one is very comfortable, but to understand PT, it can be really helpful to vary the length of breath at this stage. So because while the, the longest length is very helpful for developing the first group of jhana, and maybe I should say why, why that is, the longest length is slow, and the the reason that the the reason that it's helpful for the first rupa jhana is exactly that time scale. Um, in ordinary sensory consciousness, the the time scale that we live in is quite quick. The key the key scale factor is one hundred milliseconds. A tenth of a second, which is actually the, the reaction time. It's almost the shortest thought. It's the shortest um, duration from an impulse that we see or we hear um, to process that and then react. 100 milliseconds. It's, it really comes from all the biological and um, nervous system parts of the body. That's the fastest reaction time. But in jhana, the, the EEG study that you may have read, the scale factor is at least um, two orders of magnitude longer, even three. So instead of a tenth of a second, the scale factor is something between 10 and 100 seconds. Very slow, which is why we experience jhana as almost timeless. So the longest length of breath, breath is actually very helpful to feed into that. But for the understanding of PT in the second group of jhana, it's actually very helpful to return and practice between the, the longer, shorter and shortest. Why is this? The longer length of breath we can feel it activates the, the central part of the body, the heart and chest area. The shorter length of breath activates the diaphragm, the lower chest and diaphragm. And the shortest length of breath is the lower stomach area. And the meditator who practices between the different lengths for a while will notice that the energization varies. And very often you find that in the shorter and shortest lengths, it becomes very strong. Not for everyone, but for most people, there's at least a touch of that. So it helps you to get a sense of the way the body can wake up in the shorter and shortest lengths. You need more concentration to hold it. And that higher concentration somehow stimulates the nervous systems in the body into express, expressing PT. Once you get more familiar with it, then it's okay to use one particular length. When you're practicing, generally this happens naturally. But if you really want to understand the second group of jhana, um, it does help to um, Explore it. Explore the processes of PT a little more. 
In fact, the second Rupa Jhana is all around exploring beauty, understanding how it arises, how it gets tranquilized into samadhi. In the Samatha tradition that we have, sometimes on strict practices on a retreat, we use methods what we with various refer to as one way practice or psychic power practice or just PT practice to do that. But I don't think we can do that online. Um, so another method which is gentler and very interesting relies on um, an area of the yoga vichara to do with yantra. I'm sure many of you have seen this one before. It's one of my all-time favorites. What it is is actually the, the symbol in the old Khom Cambodian characters for Bu. So the inner one is drawn first, Bu. Then the second one around it, Bu. And the third, Bu. And this particular yantra is called Layers, layers of Buddha. It's actually very relevant to the practice of Buddha, which some of you know, which is probably one of the oldest Samatha practices to develop jhana. A meditator practicing Buddha is different to Anapanasati. On the in-breath, Bu is, in, is intoned with the intention to arouse pity. And on the out-breath, Do is used to tranquilize that piti into jhana. Buddha. And this is, the reason I'm showing this is not because of the Buddha practice, but because the form of this yantra, to me anyway, is very evocative of the way the breath um, fills the body rises up and gradually fills the body, just like pity eventually fills the body. So the way to practice this is, first of all, if you want to practice drawing it, just to get familiar with it. Drawing it also gives you some understanding of it just by doing it. You may not know exactly what you're understanding, but drawing a yantra is very interesting. And this particular one, each one of the book, that you draw, draw it on an in-breath. Draw it on an in-breath in a continuous motion. Pause for a while, pay no attention to the out-breath, and draw the next one again on the in-breath. Pause, then the third one. When you pause, it's rather like going through the you know, Vitaka, Vichara, um, into PT, or going through touching, following, sorry, counting, following, touching, into settling. As you repeat this on each breath, you strengthen your nimitta. So first of all, you might want to play with drawing this to get used to it. But in your actual practice, from time to time, you can test this out. So if you want to strengthen your nimitta, if you feel a bit flat, or you, you want to just understand a bit more about how you can influence the energy in the body, then imagine as you breathe in that you're drawing in the breath and you're allowing it to fill the body up, 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 until at the end of the in-breath, you place your attention on the nimitta, somewhere ahead of you, as you're looking at it with peripheral vision. Let the out-breath look after itself, and in the next breath, the same thing. Allow the body, allow the air to fill the body, rise up to the point of nimitta which you've never left because you haven't been paying attention to the out-breath can look after itself. And you'll notice that each time you do this, within just a few breaths, the nimitta will get clearer 
whether it's visually clear or a sense of touch, touch, it doesn't matter. You will know that you've influenced the limiter. And it becomes, something becomes stronger and connected. In a strict practice, if we were in a situation where we were practicing together, it's possible to explore deliberately arousing PT and then also deliberately calming it down, um, which is capacity. Arous arousing it, strengthening it, calming it down. And gradually you've learned by doing that that process deepens the stillness, deepens the meditation towards samadhi. And the symbol for the second rupa jhana is a bowl of water. So gradually, any disturbance in the body becomes tranquilized. The water becomes very still. No disturbance, nothing is needed to replenish it and nothing leaks over the edge. Everything is just contained beautifully <coughs> as the second jhana develops. The stillness deepens. The, because there's no you're now much further away from thinking. You don't have to worry about Pitaka Vichara. The feeling is deeper. PT becomes satisfaction and the beginnings of Sukha. And everything comes together into absorption of Samadhi in the second Rupa Jhana. In the Yoga Vichara, there's a kind of esoteric um, parallel to this. A lot of the yoga vichara um, teachings make an analogy to the journey of a, a, a baby or a fetus in the womb. So the analogy with this is almost like the meditator returns to a primordial state in the womb before you have to engage fully with the sensory world. It's carefully contained, self-sufficient. You don't have to worry about feeding. You don't have to worry about very much, providing, providing the mother is quite uh, uh, contained too. And so some of the practices in the Yoga Vachara take this analogy um, much further, at almost to the point of setting up retreat situations, almost like cells, where a meditator can um, retreat into for the duration of a specific practice and regard it as a kind of rebirth or a journey through, through the um, stages of being in the womb, and then to be to emerge with a different understanding into the world. Lots and lots of analogies with the bowls and the womb in the yoga vichara. You know, when a, when a monk ordains, it's usually his mother who donates the bowl. And it symbolically, it's, it's a kind of new womb for the new life as a monk. So the, the kind of maternal path container in meditation in the yoga vichara is absolutely central. Okay, I think that is definitely enough talk. So we practice for a while, 20 to 30 minutes, and um, rather than use my usual bell, I'm going to use that recording. I'll sound the bell to begin practice. Do your own practice in whatever form you feel inclined to, bearing in mind what we've been talking about. And then at the end of the practice, I'll sound the bell again. And when you come out of the practice, stay with the stillness for a while. And then we'll see if anything comes up that people want to comment on or share.
So our usual procedure is, in case there's anyone new here, if anything comes to mind based on your practice that you want to share, uh, comment, question to the group, whatever, feel please feel free to do so. It's bound to be of interest to most of the group, probably all the group. No one need respond until maybe two, three, four, five comments. And then if some kind of theme emerges, then it may be more open to discuss. discuss. Not been practicing a lot, so I get a lot of distractions. So I noticed all the distractions coming up. And then um, um, that I realised that the, the distractions were um, to do um, I'm trying to make this connection. The, the, the grief of separation from what I'm trying to do when I practice um, caused a lot of pity, um, which was really interesting. So um, that's the thing I noticed. Um, but all, all of these distractions and pity and things, they're, they're, they're not, um, they're keeping me away from the nimitta. So they're not, not really helping. That's it. It's not the first time that, that this happens to me, but sometimes it's when I'm getting to a stage of deeper concentration that there is something in me that wants, wants to run away from it. So the moment I'm getting somewhere, there's something screaming that it has been enough. I have to go. And it's very strange because it happens every time, I think, that when I'm reaching a, a stage of deeper concentration, that's I'm always almost pulled away from it. It's like it's uh, something that's um, well, like I've reached something, so now it's enough. So now I have to go, something like that. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I've, I've got one that might be related to that. The word that popped into my head was surrender. So rather than a running away, there was a kind of fighting back going on. Like the, the default uh, consciousness or way of being was kind of fighting back against the a new way of being that was coming up in the practice. Um, but then I found it wasn't really a, I, I found it became easier when I had this idea of surrender. Um, but then I found it wasn't really a full surrender because I got diverted into this, like analyzing the process of surrendering rather than fully surrendering to the experience. I think what helped me, uh, you were talking about the, the bowl, but I've recently seen about the simile of the tortoise or the shell or the turtle, where you, the, you <clears throat> if the tortoise withdraws the five senses, so the head and the four limbs in more and more into the shell. And, and trusting that you will do that, then it will be a very safe place to be because the shell is very, very tough. <clears throat> you know, there's a, a, a footage of lions trying to trying to eat the shell and uh, they can't penetrate it. So in some senses, what people are saying is a certain amount of fear about maybe letting go or, oh yes, I'm busy, busy. I haven't got time for this, but just saying to yourself, well, this is possibly the, one of the best gifts you could give yourself <laughs> and, and, and really just um, trusting that process. Um, Being where it leads, and using using the breath deliberately, quite exaggerated, um, which I don't tend to do, but um, deliberately exaggerating the breath, which does tend to uh, take over from your thought thinking. You know, give less attention to your thinking, or or see a space between your thinking, even just 
oh, there's a space where I haven't thought for a while. Oh, there's another space in between what I was jabbering about in my head. So paying more attention to the spaces between the thinking and um, and that the then the energy of the breath then takes over from that that jabber jabber of the mind. Um. Two images from the suttas have been quite helpful recently. It said that the deities corresponding to second jhana are the Abhasara devas. The name means streaming with radiance, and they're also described as feeding on joy. Those images of streaming with radiance and feeding on joy I find very helpful in terms of knocking on saying jhana or the joy quality of bringing in bringing in joy with the light of the nimitta as you breathe in and letting it pervade and then kind of glowing <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I was moving along through the a kind of longest of counting, longer of counting, really quite a nice, long, steady, kind of quite comfortable, quite settled sort of feeling. And then I came to a place of, of thinking, um, I suddenly felt a bit of worry. I can't remember what Paul was saying. <laughs> and I really wanted to bring um, some aspects of what you've been talking about into the practice. And um, so there's a little bit of gentle worry. It wasn't terrible, but I, was, I had a little bit of disappointment there. And then all of a sudden it became very bright outside. I think the sun suddenly lit up, which is what's made me want to talk because Peter talking about the glow. And all of a sudden I came to the lovely kind of big, lovely glowy nimitta that's recently um, finally <laughs> started to, to come into the practice a bit. So there was this lovely glow and there was the joy as well. It was quite a joyful, lovely kind of place. And parts of the talk started then to come back to me. And um, the main one that came back really um, strongly was the yantra. And I, I started to kind of picture the yantra um, quite clearly and then started to try and link the breath with it and I had gone through kind of like a shorter breath at that point with the with the glowy but um it was quite difficult to do like um a shorter breath through the whole um shape of it so the breath started becoming longer and more comfortable and I'm much happier much more um much steadier and more peaceful in the longer and the longest breath so I find myself doing that and trying to kind of mm, not connect with the out breath. And um, very recently, um, well, this year, maybe I've started instead of like going a, a gentle kind of forward and back kind of pity sort of feeling, I've started to kind of go sideways. And it's a really, really different kind of um, experience. And this was happening stronger and stronger not in a big way, not getting wider and wider, but just the, the, the kind of feeling of that kind of rocking. And maybe it, it goes back a little bit to sort of um, a Tai Chi kind of, that sort of, because um, I do Tai Chi. So, but I stayed with it for quite a long time. And, and um, I was also kind of saying to myself in my back of my mind, I must write it down, I must draw it. <laughs> I must draw it, I must kind of, um, get to know this a bit more fully because it was really very special and um and then um all of a sudden as well the um katina um phrase came up and i started to see the colors and i've recently started knitting and i have knitted a white square a yellow square and a red square and i had all this excitement i must do a blue square <laughs> and so i just kind of like came to the end with a bell you know in this um kind of not exactly excited, but very um, inspired kind of state of like, you know, I've got something I must do, <laughs> um, which is, is very different to how I have been feeling, you know, a few months ago and on and off through the whole year. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lizzie. Um, I had a really weird practice today. <laughs> 
quite the opposite to how it normally is. So it's usually kind of very smooth and um, and peaceful. And it was all over the place. Um, it felt like there was a lot of energy right at the beginning. And I, I couldn't do the longest breath. It was just too jerky. I couldn't do the longer breath. <laughs> and it just felt like the, the breath had no place to go nowhere where it felt comfortable um very odd and then in the end I just well just you know let it do whatever it wants and it, it just kind of went all over the place <laughs> it didn't stay in one length for any amount of time but it seemed to be associated with with a lot of PT coming up immediately and also some sort of emotion you know behind that too linked with mothers I think <laughs> um and but also you know quite a strong sense of that you know having some contact with that fine material kind of realm so quite quite interesting <laughs> so when you say when you say um Sarah that it was all over the place looking at you now um, quite a different impression. What's it left you with? How would you describe the, the feeling state? Um, by the end of the practice, it, the, the breath had kind of, um, I suppose, not gone back to normal. The system has become more settled by the end of the practice. Um, but there's still a lot of energy now. Mm. Mm. But it looks, looking at you, it looks quite contained, quite embodied. Hmm. Yes, it certainly felt it was all going on within <laughs> a sense, some sense of unification, certainly, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Is, this, is this army in the group? Is army, are you around? Yes. How do you find the practice? <laughs> Um, I find that it's particularly when you rang the bell towards the end and uh, that the state, I could feel that the front of me, like a lady you described as a silvery kind of uh, image. And uh, my body, it's from head to my bottom of this, uh, body was really it integrated with the space and uh, so I was really feeling uh, equanimity really hardly I was breathing it's almost uh, yeah didn't want it maybe shortest but it's a uh, it's almost like a stop breathing and then maintaining that kind of stillness, tranquility. And uh, I was quite difficult finish practicing because uh, after you rang the bell, this thing as a body and the space was really, really expanding. And I wanted to carry on that experience. Mm. Um. When I was with, um, I moved into a short breath for the, f the following and for the touching. And um, I don't know if it was a sh connected to the short breath or just the state that I'm in at the moment, but I, I noticed that I was um, releasing kind of shock, sort of like, um, like fear, the fight, or more like flight kind of energy. I was releasing that, and then the bell went. <laughs> so, I, but but that does relate to to my practice because when I I am more when I've I, sometimes I'm just releasing fear before I can actually settle, and then I can go into the pity um, place. And then I find that I have a lot of energy and I can actually raise the energy uh, because I do Qigong and I do Tai Chi practice. So it's sort of like, that's a familiar place. I can feel kind of like spontaneous kind of uh, movement starting to happen. 
but I'm not very good, I noticed, I'm not very good at the how to, how to calm that energy, mm. how to calm it. So, uh, and, and it's not because I'm in a place of, you know, sort of just re you know, releasing fear. It's just sometimes that energy can be mm. really um, joyful. I feel alive. But it, that aliveness can take me away from that calmness. You know, it's a sort of, it's a bit opposite to where I'm going to. Um, so I don't get much further in my practice than PT. And I'm just wondering if it's because I'm not a very, in, well, it's, it's just, I, I just wondered if I'm actually in a place where I'm becoming more embodied and I have to be patient with that before I can actually move on to these, these other, other calm states. So it's, I'm just wondering if I just need to be patient with this process of embodiment before I can move on to these other states. So I've... S okay. You know, the, these comments um, are really, really helpful. Um, I can talk about the kind of threshold <coughs> that we're all dealing with between the familiar sensory consciousness and moving towards something quite defined material and how tricky that is and so on. But you've described, all of you have been describing how you experience that. And it's so helpful to me too, to hear that in different perspectives. It fills in the picture and kind of um, deepens the understanding. Um, there are so many things that came up in those comments. I think there are two, two kind of um, points. One is that there is a, almost like a getting used to it um, part, which is quite normal. You know, we simply are not used to the fine material sphere. We're not used to what happens if you let go and disengage from thinking, comparing this to that, discriminating, letting go also the sense of time, because the sensory consciousness is a continuous process of this leading to that, leading to something else, leading to that. Whereas in fine material, it's not linear in that sense at all. It's almost like it can evolve through images or through metaphor or through fractals. So letting go of time and space comes into this, which is quite a new sort of experience. So. That's one side of it that there's kind of getting used to, you know. And in that sense, you, you, you do get used to it. That's a lot of the practice of meditation is being patient with yourself and not seeing it as a, a, a failure or a problem and just patiently continuing with dispassion. So equanimity has to be practiced to some extent from the beginning, even though, as someone mentioned, um, it could feel like the, you know, the completion point. I think it was Hisami. Of course it is, in the fourth Rupa Jhana. And then quite a number of you are describing it in a, in a different way, where not just getting used to it, but what it releases are really important things, individual to uh, each of us. It may be um, fear. We touch on something which is, um, we don't quite know why. We have to run away from or get away from. Or we may know why. It may be a fear of being dropped, you know, fear of, fear of um, endings, um, losing the anchors of sensory consciousness. What's familiar could be fear. It could be, it could be doubt. Um, it could be 
wanting something, a kind of subtle greed. And that, those kind of themes that people are talking about, they highlight something really important, that when you start to practice towards charm, it will inevitably release quite deep um, stuff in our experience. You know, in the, some of you will know the transcendental jhana chant, the one that starts kusala dhamma, kusala dhamma, abhyagata dhamma. And the, I can't remember the exact phrase, but in the, in the chanting of the transcendental jhana chant, the first part of it is the process leading up to the to Rupa Jhana, to the first Rupa Jhana, Ataman Jhana. And part of the phrasing is that um, the meditator is creating a new dwelling place of Jhana, a new Vihara. And as, as he moves towards Jhana, there is particularly the interesting phrase called dispersal. I can't remember the final word, but it's dispersal of kama. And in this tradition, it's not particularly widely known, but it is in Tibetan meditation, that the development of jhana speeds up or releases um, certain things that you, you can deal with more quickly than you might otherwise do. So at some point when you experience these things, you know, um, fear or doubt or whatever it is. Again, if you can hold your nerve at that point and restore some degree of bearing it, and um, I mean, people mention various things at this point. Someone mentioned forgive yourself. Another mentioned, um, what was it? Um, surrender. There, there are all sorts of ways of maybe normalizing it. Or another way of looking at it is that this is a good example that what we practice is not just jhana and samatha. It is automatically developing vipassana. You cannot progress into full the jhanas without developing quite strongly vipassana. You know, it's fairly obvious really. You know, if we're really attached to sensory consciousness through wanting or not wanting, liking or not liking, then it's going to be very difficult to let go. So there has to be some insight developing into what's the root, what are the roots of that attachment. So one of the key practices, which is very helpful at this stage too, is at the end of the practice, if you want to, just bring to mind after you stayed with the stillness for a while, or maybe at the beginning of that, bring to mind the three signs. Anicca, impermanence, dukkha, suffering, anatta, no self. Anisha, dukkha, and their two sides are the same coin. The things which touch us, which are sometimes difficult, revolve around impermanence, losing something we loved or trusted, being dropped, impermanence and the suffering from it. Okay. Those are two sides of the same coin. The third one, anatta, is the letting go of all that. And it's an interesting experiment at the end in the stillness, just to bring that to mind occasionally, anicca, dukkha, anatta. No need to think about them. It's like a, a kind of um, mantra, or and, and it has an effect. And also, you know, the, the bodily stuff, a couple of people mentioned uh, Tai Chi or Qigong, Pauline and uh, Hisami, I think, maybe somebody else, Lizzie. And again, at this stage, it makes it very, very clear what's going on in the body. And if you are doing something like, like Tai Chi or Qigong, <coughs> it's very helpful. Or you can invent it yourself. Just 
doing very simple movements, you know, and really feeling them. Really feeling them. And all this is within the first or second Rupa Jhana. So typical, everything you have raised, the comments, are absolutely central to what happens in the first and second Rupa Jhana. That's why I wanted to talk about them together. They lay the foundation for the third and fourth. Paul, can I ask a question? Although my um, practice today was very tranquil, and uh, peaceful but after i started the talking i felt a lot of emotion coming and i wanted to cry <laughs> and so it's a contrast why is that something coming from deep, deep inside what what is the question his army well compared to my practice itself today was very peaceful and calm mm. but mm. now afterwards i feel quite emotional emotion coming out mm. and it's something more kind of deeper emotion is coming out they're releasing something yeah absolutely and it's a real um, opportunity you know the original the root cause may have been some maybe something but that happens to us where there's been some pain sadness suffering and then it may come up in after meditation like this it's like it's like um of course in the body different parts may not be relaxed you know certain areas of shoulders may be tight the uh, hips may be tight and as you practice the first or the second rupa jhana and particularly developing pt and learning how to you know feel that energy moving around in the body it relaxes all that but it also inev inevitably relaxes or frees the emotional parts held in the body so in that sense it's quite normal and again it's a matter of holding your balance and fully experiencing it if the tears come let the tears come fully experiencing it without fear and without trying to suppress it or hang on to it and it will pass and then you recollect uh, you recollect the baker mm. so in fact it sounds trite to say it, but in fact, it's not a bad sign. You know, sometimes it's better to free the free the mm -hmm. thing. And in in that sense, the meditation is is quite remarkable how it can do that in a safe mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. In a safe way. Thank you. Hi, um, Paul. I've got a question about the, the description um, earlier about the colours. So it first said about blue light arising and then later um, golden white light. And I'm just wondering why those particular colours and um, why are they significant more than any other colours? You mean the, this was a description for the different stages of PT, wasn't it? Yes. Um, well, I think this is one of those areas where we need, we need to realise that um, not to take too rigidly what different um, texts in the Yoga Vachara um, say in, in that kind of detail because of looking at the the experiences in um, our meditators over 50 years my, my sense is there is actually quite a, a large variation there may well be one general point within it though 
that in moving towards uh, the deeper stages of absorption, the, the light tends to become clear and, and, and bright without any particular color. But in the earlier stages, I, people experience a whole range of colors at different times. Um, and so, you know, you look at the yoga Achara text and uh, that, a little bit like Tibetan Tantras. It's, they come from different groups who are under a particular teacher who may have taught in a certain way and different people have different focus perceptions. So you have to temper it with what happens to you. I mean, for example, I remember on one practice we were talking about um, the, the value of nature at Green Street. It was, a, it was a, an early, probably an early spring time of year. And one of the things we came up in just general discussion was the powerful effect of colour. And if you'd examine, if you asked people at that point what, um, what was happening in their practice, quite a lot of them would have been seeing beautiful golden colour. Or, or a almost like luminous red color in their practice. And it happened to be the time of year when the, the daffodils was, were stunning. And also in another part of the garden, the, the poppies were, were, were absolutely luminous. So it depends partly on the individual and the circumstances. I mean, in color, in color casino, the main choice of color is to find a color which is beautiful to that person. So if the feeling underlying your meditation is tending towards happiness and, and um, joy, then it may be that those colors, which mean something to you individually, may tend to come up. That's my view. Other people may have, may have different views. Yeah, my feeling was that golden white is quite refined, but this text was quite prescriptive and said it starts with blue. But like, yeah, like you say, it could be different. But, yeah. So yeah. It's a little bit like using colours in too rigid a way. It's easy to get kind of caught in it and expect it has to be that way. It's a little bit like um, some traditions teaching chakras and people then practice in a way where they expect or want to develop what they are taught is happening in terms of chakras in different parts of the body. Even in the Yoga Vichara, there are some there are some groups who practice by uh, placing different syllables in places in the body. But I remember, and I think it's similar to the color dilemma, fixing things too quickly. And I remember when I started, I'd been practicing um, some yoga um, on my own. I knew nothing about Buddhist meditation, but it was a kind of yoga which was very energetic, Kundalini yoga. Or my my own version of it, um, and I remember asking the teacher in almost in the first uh, week or the first couple of weeks. This is Nai Bhuma, Would it be helpful to continue that alongside meditation? And he um, immediately said um, his advice was not necessary. That in this tradition. It, everything unfolds naturally and nothing is left out. And looking back, I really can understand how that works because I tried to continue for a while and all sorts of difficulties came up. And actually what happens teaching and listening to meditators in my own practice is that, for example, the four lengths of breath we had in a very natural way develop awareness of the whole body. Um, the whole body in the longest length, the, 
the heart area, the throat area, the stomach area, without putting any labels on them. And I think it's the same principle not to get too hung up on, on the colour ought to be this or that. Okay. So, very happy to continue next week with the, with the next one. Thank you. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.